Welcome everybody to uh, the next uh, version of our critical conversations. As all of you know, we've been uh, starting these uh, series to have the touch various areas with that uh, we want to be bring to the forefront in our institution here at Gladstone. Uh, and one of those uh, that I'm very delighted that the Women's Initiative has highlighted is uh, talking more about sexual harassment. We've done a lot of training here at Gladstone and had this at the forefront, uh, but we're really lucky today to have uh, the, the leading panel, as you'll hear from Katie in a moment, who will just describe them a, a bit more, but to, uh, to really uh, help us think about uh, things we can do about this in the future, be more aware, uh, and uh, th this is really the, the leading group in the country. So we're really lucky to have them here today. And I'm going to turn it over to Katie to do a deeper introduction. Great, thanks. In uh, 2018, the National Academies released a consensus study report that was entitled Sexual Harassment of Women, Climate, Culture, and Consequences in Academic Sciences and Medicine. This really important report examined the prevalence of all forms of sexual harassment in academia and its impact on the career advancement of women. It provides a series of recommendations for system-wide changes to the culture and climate in higher education, many of which are included in Gladstone's strategic plan. I'm very pleased to welcome three members of the committee that wrote that report, Lilia Cortina, Kate Clancy, and Vicki Magley. I'm particularly grateful for their spending this time with us today for two reasons. First of all, thanks to input from several of you, we've realized that Gladstone's discussions of gender and science have not sufficiently addressed and tackled the topic of harassment. So thanks to those for bringing it to our attention. Second, these women use a very rigorous data-driven approach uh, that I really appreciate and I think will resonate with our community. So this conversation is critical and we have the honor of being led in it by three of the most compelling sexual harassment researchers in the United States. Lilia Cortina is a professor of psychology and women's studies at the University of Michigan. Her research centers around the victimization of individuals, particularly women, in the social context of work, with a special focus on personal and professional outcomes of the targeted individual. Kate Clancy is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois. Her research is focused on how environmental stressors influence the reproductive functioning of women and gender minorities which serves as a basis for her activism in the area of reproductive justice. Vicki Magley is a professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut. Her work combines organizational and feminist perspectives in the study of the antecedents and consequences of sexual harassment in the workplace. Their presentations today will focus on debunking common beliefs in our culture around sexual harassment and addressing some of the lesser known facts about sexual harassment. So we're gonna be learning a lot today. Thanks so much to the three of you for being with us virtually today. Lilia, I invite you to take the floor. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna share the screen here now so you can see my slides. Um, okay, there we go. So um, I've been engaged in the scientific study of sexual harassment for about 25 years now. And one thing that's striking is um, how much that science has not gotten to the general public in the sense of there are still being uh, many myths and misconceptions out there in society about this topic. So what we've organized uh, our presentations around today is debunking some of those myths and presenting you with some of the, the facts and some of the, the truths around sexual harassment, if you will, um, as uncovered through scientific research. So I'm going to talk through the first of these myths, the idea that sexual harassment is primarily a problem of sex. Uh, my colleague Kate Clancy will address the notions that sexual harassment is no big deal and that false accusations are a big deal. And then Vicki Magley will then hit on these ideas and these myths about sexual harassment reporting and sexual harassment training being the sort of silver bullet here. Okay, let's start with the first of these. Um, the idea that sexual harassment is primarily a problem of sex. So some notions that are related to this are that 
uh, sexual harassment is mostly about misplaced sexual desire or flirting or romance gone awry, or the idea that the worst sexual harassment is physically violent and coercive. Um, that those, those are the worst cases. So let me just emphasize, these are myths, these are fallacies, these are fictions, okay? These are widely believed, but patently false. Um, we know from, from the research record. Um, instead, what's true is that sexual harassment uh, comes in at least three forms, and I'm gonna define those and walk you through those in a moment, but this includes physical behavior, verbal, visual, uh, both sexual and non-sexual behaviors. And uh, we also know from research that physical forms of sexual harassment um, are not objectively worse or always worse for women's well-being than verbal or visual forms. And again, I'll walk through what I mean by that in a moment. So let's start with this first point, the, uh, that sexual harassment comes in at least three forms. So a lot of behavioral science has accumulated at this point to kind of define and explain the different subtypes of sexual harassment. Um, so one of the types that's commonly recognized or commonly thought to be the main form of sexual harassment is sexual coercion. And this refers to implicit or explicit attempts to make the conditions of employment contingent upon sexual cooperation. So this is the prototypical, you know, sleep with me or you're fired kind of situation. It's often the first thing that comes to people's minds when they hear the term sexual harassment, but we know from research that it's actually the rarest form that this behavior takes. Um, a little more common is unwanted sexual attention. And that is exactly what it sounds like. Unwanted touching, hugging, stroking, uh, repeated uh, requests for dates or sexual behavior despite discouragement. So unwanted sexual attention can and sometimes does include sexual assault. But most sexual harassment falls into the third category known as gender harassment. And this refers to conduct that conveys hostility, exclusion, or second-class status about members of one gender group, oftentimes women, but in some cases men as well. So for example, you have comments that denigrate women as dumb blondes who can't cut it in engineering, um, dumb sluts who don't belong in science, dumb bitches who are taking jobs away from better qualified men. And some people might find it kind of jarring to hear language like that in a scientific talk, but I use that deliberately to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how upsetting it can be to hear that kind of language in a professional setting. Um, just imagine how upsetting it would be coming from one of your colleagues, uh, from your supervisor, from your students. So gender harassment is not about romance or sex. It's, uh, it's not even about sexual conquest. Instead, it's about contempt. So gender harassment is often the, the form of sexual harassment that tends to be least understood. So uh, what does it look and feel like on, for people on the receiving end? Um, so here's a narrative to explain that based on an in-depth interview uh, with an assistant professor of engineering who talks about uh, demeaning the woman, shutting her up in the workplace, demeaning her in front of other colleagues, telling her that she's not as capable as others are. It's not just you know touching or making sexual advances, but it's more of at the intellectual level. They try to mentally play those mind games basically so that you won't be able to perform. So this is a, these are all perfect examples of gender harassment. And of course, by perfect, I mean awful. So the reason I hit on gender harassment so hard is because it's the most common form that sexual harassment takes. And here's just a little bit of data just to illustrate that point. Um, these data come from surveys of faculty and staff at a large public university. And uh, uh, these are women faculty and staff reporting um, uh, what sorts of sexually harassing behavior they've encountered in the past two years of work. Okay. And you can see if you start with the, the white slice of the pie on the left, that a little over a third of these women faculty and staff reported no harassment in the past two years. Okay. They didn't see any form of gender harassment or unwanted sexual pursuit. But this means that 63% did encounter at least one variant of sexually harassing conduct. Okay, that's six in 10 women. And most of the experiences involved some form of gender harassment. 4% um, of women faculty or staff had also encountered uh, sexual coercion. 
Similarly, an alarmingly high rate of women students are sexually harassed by their faculty or staff. Um, I don't know how many of you on this uh, session are students. Some of you might be supervising students. Some of you might be postdocs who are recently students. Um, but again, just to illustrate and drive this point home, here are findings from one university, one organization. Um, these findings I'm showing you today, by the way, all these graphs, these are uh, not unusual, but we've seen very similar findings across a variety of different kinds of organizations. Um, so this uh, shows you the percent of women students who've been harassed in the past year by faculty or staff, by their own faculty or staff at the university, at a different university from the last one. And here um, we've broken down the uh, harassment into the different types. And you can see the percent of women who've been harassed across different uh, degree programs. So you've got women pursuing degrees in the natural and social sciences, um, those pursuing degrees in engineering, in medicine, and then in fields outside of STEM. So and what, what we found across fields um, were, was that there was no difference in rates of sexual coercion, okay? So those are the small, goal, uh, excuse me, orange bars or little slivers on the right. Um, and you can see that 1% of women, regardless of field, um, has faced some kind of attempt at sexual coercion from a, a faculty or staff member. Um, we also didn't see any disciplinary differences in experiences of unwanted sexual attention. Those are the little greenish turquoise bars. Okay, two to four percent had seen some kind of unwanted sexual attention. So let me be clear: um, one percent, two percent, four percent. These are relatively low rates, but they are still too high. Okay, one percent of students is still too many students being sexually coerced. No student, um, female or otherwise, should ever have to put up with any of this sort of behavior in return for the right uh, to receive an, an education. But what's perhaps most striking in this graph, though, is the incidence rates of gender harassment. Um, and, and rates of gender harassment are high in every domain, but this is where we do see disciplinary differences. The, the students pursuing medical degrees stand out as facing more gender harassment than the students in any other field. And here the gender harassment has been broken down into two sub, subtypes. So sexist disparagement of women, in navy blue bars, and then sort of crude, lewd, sexualized disparagement in, in the gray bars. Um, both experiences are unacceptably high. So these data I'm showing you all reflect women's experiences. Um, you might be wondering, what about men? Don't they also get sexually harassed? And there is uh, science that speaks to this, and the answer is yes. Um, men are sexually harassed, and when they are, more often than not, the perpetrator is another man in the organization and he's in engaging what we call not man enough harassment. So it's one man demeaning another man or trying to humiliate another man for um, engaging in childcare, for participating in domestic work around the house, for not participating in crude, nasty jokes or commentary about women, for being too sensitive, uh, too soft-spoken, too gay, in other words, uh, uh, in some way, not living up to the ideals of traditional heterosexual masculinity. So you can think about these different forms of sexual harassment as sort of an iceberg. So unwanted sexual attention, sexual coercion, and sexual assault are at the very top. So those are the behaviors that break through to public view, um, that make it into the news, that are widely recognized as impermissible sexual harassment. These are also the behaviors that tend to be the focus of a lot of policies and procedures and, and trainings around sexual harassment. But the research record is clear. Uh, more often than not, sexual harassment is a put down, not a come on. So the bulk of this iceberg includes examples of gender harassment, okay? Um, these, this is conduct that demeans, that derogates, that humiliates people based on gender. And the gender harassing conduct is entirely submerged in this image because most people don't realize that it is a form of sexual harassment. And as these examples make uh, clear, hopefully, um, this is not about romance gone awry. It's not about trying to pull women into sexual relationships. Instead, it's about pushing women out. So out of careers where they're seen not to belong, out of jobs where they're seen not to fit, where they're seen to be encroaching on um, the territory of men. So this is sexual harassment because it's based on 
sex, meaning sex and gender. So sometimes it's tempting to assume a sort of continuum of severity within these different acts of abuse. So is it the case, for example, that verbal sexual overtures are never as bad as physical ones? Um, are the worst offenses the ones that turn sexual, if not serial? And in contrast, are sexist jokes and insults uh, sort of no big deal? So our National Academies Committee reviewed the scientific evidence and found that none of these assumptions uh, holds up to scrutiny. So according to research, even when sexual harassment entails nothing but sexist insult, without any sort of unwanted sexual pursuit, it takes a toll on victims, okay? It's about putting women down, right? Uh, putting women down and pushing them out. So Victor Soho is, a, is an organizational psychologist at the University of Melbourne. And he published a great meta-analysis a few years ago that really drives this point home. Um, in case you're not familiar, a meta-analysis is simply a, uh, a technique for quantitatively synthesizing all known studies of a topic. So you put all the findings of the studies you can find on that topic in one analysis, and you can see what effects are coming out consistently across studies, and you can quantify the magnitude of those effects. And for this study, uh, Soho looked at relationships between encounters with the different subtypes of sexual harassment and self-reports of physical health symptoms and satisfaction with supervisors, coworkers, and the job in general. And it's striking when you compare the effect sizes. So these are the effect sizes simply uh, graphed. And here are effect sizes, for example, for sexual coercion. And you can see the comparing the magnitudes of the different effects you see much larger effects for supervisor satisfaction than for job satisfaction. That's interesting. What's even more interesting is that when you compare these effect sizes for the, the ones for unwanted sexual attention and then for gender harassment. So the most striking conclusion that emerged from the study to me is that gender harassment has at least as great, if not a greater relationship with uh, personal and professional health compared to unwanted sexual attention or sexual coercion. Okay, so gender harassment is at least as bad, if not worse in some cases, um, for particular um, aspects of work and well-being. So this flies in the face of a lot of popular wisdom. How do we make sense of findings like this? Um, Soho and colleagues have some great language to explain these effects. And they, they write that sexual coercion and unwanted sexual attention are traumatic for the people involved and more likely to result in court cases and public reporting. However, in many work settings, these intense experiences are low frequency events. The more frequent, less intense, and often unchallenged gender harassment, sexist discrimination, sexist organizational climates appear at least as detrimental for women's well-being. They should not be considered lesser forms of sexism. So let me leave you with a few questions to ponder. So sexual harassment policies and reporting procedures and penalties for, for policy violation often focus heavily on unwanted sexual pursuit and sexual coercion. So this is a focus that is absolutely necessary, but altogether insufficient. So it's only taking aim at the, at the tip of the iceberg. Most sexual harassment never finds its way into a formal complaint. Okay, most of it goes unreported. And more often than not, remember that sexual harassment is typically a put down, not a come on. So what are we doing to address the many slights and indignities that combine to relegate women to the margins of organizational life? How can we transform our organizational cultures to be more respectful, more hospitable, to treat all people with dignity, regardless of their gender, sex, race, sexual orientation, ability status, or any other dimension of difference. If we can start to, fig to figure out answers to questions like these, then we might be able to begin to move the needle on sexual harassment. So keep these questions in mind as I turn the floor over to my colleague, Kate Clancy, who will take it from here. Thank you so much, Lilia. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. And here we go. Okay, so now we've heard that sexual harassment isn't sexual, 
It isn't about dates gone wrong or lecherous old dudes. Sexual harassment at its core is about contempt for women. It's about contempt for gender minorities, for those who are gendered feminine, and for those who do not conform to our expectations for their gender stereotypes. Something that can, can creep into the conversation next, though, is the sense that if these behaviors are low-level acts of rudeness or hostility, that they must not be a big deal. I mean, really, you chose to be a scientist. You know what you're getting yourself into, the rejection, the pain, the rudeness, right? So those targeted for sexual harassment are often gaslit, minimized, or made to feel as though their reactions to these more subtle acts are an overreaction. Yet the harms are profound and pervasive. So take a look at this figure. We see the effects, and you can see uh, I'm crediting Dr. Cortina here as one of the uh, as, as one of the authors of this paper. Um, we see the effects of incivility, which are rude behaviors of ambiguous intent, gender harassment, and more sexual forms of harassment. Now, this paper and others have shown that incivilities and gender harassment co-occur in organizations. So if you have one, you have the other. What's more, though incivilities seem to have an ambiguous intent, they somehow happen at a much higher frequency to women, especially women of color. Look at the difference in job-related outcomes when you just compare the experience of someone with no negative workplace experiences to just incivility. You can see how great the drop is just going from there to incivility and then an even greater one when we add on gender harassment. It's the biggest drop in, drop in job-related outcomes, which in this study included job satisfaction, job withdrawal, and job stress. These selectively rude behaviors targeted primarily at women have a negative effect on their work. My hope, of course, is that we don't just have a mercenary perspective on the harms of sexist behaviors, that we consider not just how sexual harassment hurts productivity, but hurts people we care about. I want you to consider for a moment what brought you to science and eventually the Gladstone. Is work your happy place? Is it where you make a difference? Is being a scientist a major part of your identity? Imagine having that feeling stripped away because the one place you go to to most be yourself is unsafe. In a sample of astronomers and planetary scientists, we asked if they had ever been made to feel unsafe at work in the last five years of their employment. Here's how they answered. Fully 40% of the women of color said that they had been made to feel unsafe due to their gender, not in their lifetimes, not on the street dealing with strangers, but at work just in the last five years. 27% of white women, 28% of women of color also reported feeling unsafe due to their race. So now this place where you do work that saves lives, that changes the way we think about the world, that contributes inventions and discoveries, that mentors the next generation is not a place of safety and happiness, but of fear. Think about the number of women of color you know and how this is the experience for almost half of them. In this same study, we found that women of color and white women also skip professional events because they feel unsafe which means they miss out on learning cool science, networking, or getting that next collaboration. Those in our sample who were reported being harassed uh, were also more likely to report skipping events. Part of the reason sexual harassment hurts women generally and women of color specifically is because in a white and male dominated workplace, they are going to struggle to find a cohort with similar experiences to them. We need the social support of people like us to contextualize our experiences, to check our thinking and ask, am I overreacting? Was that sexist or how should I handle this? In a recent study of women of color science faculty, so these were focus groups that we conducted, um, so qualitative research, we found that the participants who had that social support were somewhat able to mitigate the negative effects of harassment and discrimination. But most of the folks in our sample did not have that social net. And so instead, they internalized their experiences to such a point that they often gaslit themselves after describing to us truly disturbing events. So I'm going to give you an example of each. So the more common example in our sample was that of isolation of being, for instance, the token or the only or one of only a few women of color in their departmental unit. And so what happened was a sort of a feeling of internalized gaslighting. So as this, as this participant says, they were just so angry at me for no reason. At least I couldn't think, just like you said, maybe things you cannot prove. Yeah, maybe they think they can't be treating you like this because you're a woman and Asian and you look like there's no bigger guy behind you. Even so, I just don't understand it. There's no need to be rude. Unless I did something to them, there's no reason. Or I will give you the inverse example, which was of a, an individual who um, did have social support. So what happened in this case was 
Um, you know, those of you who have been in academic situations or in teaching situations, this was a, a case where a woman of color, a tenured woman of color was a, um, in a classroom setting and a white male student was very upset with a grade. And he began to sort of um, verbally attack the professor for not liking his grade and then sort of use these physical intimidation tactics. He began to raise his voice and get very angry. And at the end of the class, he continued to follow her to her office, continuing to berate her for his supposedly unearned lower grade. And um, what happened in this case was that uh, some of the female students of color saw it happening and decided to follow them. They followed them back to her, to her office and stayed outside and texted her throughout the interaction saying, do you want me to call campus police? Are you okay? This is really messed up. So confirmed for her in a lot of ways that what was happening to her was not okay. And this woman says, if I didn't have those other female students that were there, I don't think I would have, I think I might have left the office saying, what did I say or do that caused him to get angry? Right, so without that check, without, and this is something that should never have to happen in an organization, that the people that you mentor or the people who are your students or the people who are junior to you are the ones who are providing you with the support. And yet in this case where she was so tokenized, this was all she had. And so this kind of, this, the, the ways in which it's uh, so necessary for us to check our lived experiences against other people who have them is completely missing in settings where folks have nobody who looks like them um, in their workplace. So what do we do instead? Two, two, two responses come to mind specifically to address this myth. First, we need to acknowledge harm, or three actually, I just realized. <laughs> Many solutions to sexual harassment skip this step and want to know what to do moving forward. But without apologizing to the people in your organization today who are facing racism and sexism today, you are losing their trust in whatever you're planning next. When I say acknowledge harm, I also mean that doing so should be integrated into your daily practices. Like land acknowledgements that can feel perfunctory when performed at the beginning of a talk, a single apology to check a box is not what is going to help here. Next, and this follows from the first point, fix your climate before you fix recruiting. When I invite people to my house, at least before the pandemic, when I used to have people at my house, I would clean up a bit. I don't have them show up and not pick up the Legos until after they've stepped on them, right? I don't make them responsible for finding the problems in my house that I then fix after they've already had harm caused to them. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, right? We all uh, have a couple of like things we have to move off the couch in order to have a friend sit down, but you can't push the labor of making your space safe for women on other women. Finally, once you're ready, you need to overcome the whiteness and maleness of your organization by hiring women, and in particular women of color. But if you do it one at a time, you're still putting them in a risky climate without the appropriate tools to navigate it. Hire cohorts that can form a social net and be there for each other. Enable this gathering, mentoring, and networking within your organization. Okay, so on to my final myth. In addition to minimizing the experiences of targets of harassment, we often maximize the experiences of instigators. When victims themselves are deciding whether or not to tell anyone about an experience that has harmed them, or even ongoing issues that are continuing to harm them, many of them have been conditioned to consider what might happen to the instigator. Even worse, I've seen people worry about all of the people who surround a known perpetrator and instigator, which are actually the organization's responsibility, not that instigators. If we report his bad behavior, the whole grant will shut down and those people will lose their jobs. So let's take on the biggest fear around this, that false reports happen and cause immense harm to alleged instigators. Rather than trying to tell you they don't happen, I'm gonna say that yes, they do happen sometimes, but false reports happen in every type of crime. I'd like to ask you how much we focus on false reporting from robbery or burglary. Does the existence of false reports of these crimes diminish our belief that robbery or burglary happen? Does it make us automatically suspicious of someone who reports robbery or burglary? One of the reasons folks worry about the vulnerability in the system of false reporting is that investigating sexual harassment requires testimony. Yet testimony is a form of evidence that is used to prosecute many types of crimes, let alone negative workplace behaviors. We use testimony to convict people in the criminal justice system. Why is it less credible to use testimony when it comes from a victim of sexual harassment or assault? As an advocate in this space, Kim, Kim Lonsway has asked, have you ever heard the word accuser used for burglary or robbery? So I wanna make a few points about false reports. First, 
False reports are actually rarer than sexual harassment against men. So about two to eight, depending on the study of reports, um, are false. But somewhere between, depending on the instrument used, 14 to 40% of men in an organization are sexually harassed. So the issue is not, in fact, sorry, that, high, that false reports are impossible. The issue is that we hold overwhelming skepticism towards credible claims of harassment and assault. That is the far greater issue than whether or not a false report occasionally happens in any type of reporting system. And in fact, uh, Dr. Magley is going to get it, do a good job sort of uh, problematizing this whole concept that reporting is so wonderful and is going to save us anyway. So the next issue is that the way that we question the credibility of victims goes completely against the evidence base for completely normal victim behavior. So I'll share with you what tend to be the typical false reporting red flags. We've got knowing the accuser, having a prior relationship, there not being any severe violence, uh, the victim being young and details being inconsistent. Well, guess what the literature supports? All of these things. <laughs> they are often uh, people who are, who are victimized in sexual harassment know the accuser, have a prior relationship. It's very rarely severe. Uh, the victim is often junior or younger in some way, and that there is some difficulty in recall that can lead to inconsistent details. These are all actually normal, completely normal details of um, our experiences of people who are victimized. The other thing, sorry for that little mistake there on the slide, is that worrying about false reports can actually weaken your effectiveness in a couple of key ways. As a mentor, um, you, your effectiveness is weakened if you use the fear of false reports or the fear that you might be accused of doing something wrong to uh, no longer have closed door meetings, one-on-one -on -one conversations, meals together, difficult conversations, or real conflict engagement with women. This is something that um, this is people call it the Pence effect uh, because of his fear of uh, uh, I know people have joked around uh, what's going to happen with the uh, vice president debates because Pence is going to be actually potentially on a stage alone with a woman and not with his wife. Um, and I don't know if you really want to be compared to that. <laughs> uh, as, a, as a mentor, we should be making sure that we are not participating in illegal sex discrimination, which means that we are as available and accessible and helpful to uh, folks as we do um, to our mentees uh, to when they are women as well as when they are men. As an administrator, when you think about your effectiveness and worrying about false reports, there's two questions that you need to ask. What will really happen to your shining star professor if you actually hold them accountable for the kinds of things that they're doing that are harming other people in your organization? And what happens to your university if your risk management principles are about avoiding perpetrator lawsuits rather than future victim lawsuits? Now, I would say five or 10 years ago, worrying more about the litigiousness of perpetrators is, while potentially morally wrong, legally understandable. However, we are now moving into a space where victims are increasingly litigious. So if you are worried about lawsuits from an investigation gone wrong, and then typically find in favor of the alleged perpetrator because that seems like the safer bet because they're less likely to follow up with an additional lawsuit, that is really no longer the metric by which you should be evaluating that. So then what do we do instead? Part of the reason we're so afraid to do anything when someone causes harm is that we escalate in our heads the consequences. Don't do that. Many instances of selective incivility and gender harassment can be solved by a conversation to raise awareness, to mitigate harm, to offer the skills and space for true apology and repairing the relationship. So if you escalate in your head or you know someone who does these behaviors all the time and no boss or leader has ever done anything, don't wait to act. If you wait, you contribute to a climate of harassment and you create tolerance for bad behavior that can actually escalate. So on that note, I'm passing the mic to Vicki, whose myth busting is going to provide more clarity on how to do this right. Thanks so much, Kate. Okay, so um, thanks for joining us, um, all of us today. Truly appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna be discussing two additional myths that center around reporting and training, which are areas of my own particular um, research focus. The first of these is that harassing reporting is a silver bullet. Um, and what do I mean by this? Well, that if institutions get reporting right, they'll end their concerns with, um, with sexual harassment. So first of all, what are some of the relevant fallacies that go along with that? Um, some of these are if sexual harassment really happened, the victim would report promptly via official channels. There's nothing scary or risky about filing formal complaints. 
If official reports of sexual harassment are low, an institution does not have a problem, and that ultimately perfecting report-centered policies and procedures will solve an institution's problem with sexual harassment. There are a lot of issues with this, um, and what I want to do is go through some of the facts. In fact, sexual harassment reporting is considered a last resort and is quite rare. Um, so some of the research that I've done on how women actually respond to sexual harassment suggests that rather than thinking about do people only report or not report, that harassment reporting or harassment um, management is actually much more complex than that um, and can be thought of, of, across both engagement and disengagement and behavioral and cognitive types of realms. And when we think about um, reporting, seeking organizational relief, and even assertion that sort of falls within this behavioral engagement realm. Um, and we can also talk about other forms though, avoidance, seeking social support, relabeling an experience as benign, um, blaming themselves, trying to engage in some form of appeasement, um, even cognitively disengaging in denying and detaching and just putting up with an experience of sexual harassment. And when we think about the reporting and assertion, this is actually the least frequent of any way that people, and particularly women, actually respond to their, their experiences of sexual harassment. Um, another way of thinking about this idea of reporting is rare is by some, some data of reporting. Um, so what I have here are 1996 and 2016 um, data, so some years between, but both showing that approximately 6% of people who responded to a survey indicated in follow-up questions after they had indicated that they had had experiences of sexual harassment, um, that they had actually filed a formal report. So 6%, and these were all people who actually had had some form of experience that, would, that could be constituted as sexual harassment. So there's, there's some concerns with putting all of our eggs in a reporting basket, um, so to speak. Um, and that, that even if organizations have really enhanced their policies, um, built up their reporting mechanisms, invested in trainings and whatnot, um, these reporting rates have actually changed very little over time. Um, and that, that there are a lot of clearly reasons why people aren't actually engaging in reporting. There are a lot of, uh, a, a lot of these reasons exist. Some of them are about fear of reporting, but some of them are also um, very simple things like to report something as sexual harassment, you have to first call it sexual harassment, okay? Um, and one of the really interesting things that we do when we um, conduct surveys around sexual harassment is we ask a whole bunch of questions about behaviors that people could have had in their work environment. Um, and then at the very end, we ask, have you been sexually harassed? And it would follow that if you engaged, if you reported that you had on, on the survey, that you'd had some form of experience of one of these behaviors, that you might then go on and say, yes, I've been sexually harassed. But in fact, most women don't label their experiences. And these are four different samples here where you can see that actually saying, yes, I've been sexually harassed, um, ranges from eight to 26%. And this is pretty common. So before you actually are going to be reporting anything, you have to first label it sexual harassment. This can get back into um, Lilia's conversation earlier about gender harassment and that we just don't think about. Society hasn't been thinking about gender harassment as quote unquote sexual harassment in the same kinds of ways that the legal world has. Um, they, there could be lots of reasons for this, um, but, but the reality is, is that we're not labeling. Um, I've also engaged in some research that I'm not going to be showing you right now that it actually doesn't matter, though, if you label your experience as sexual harassment, that the consequences that can be associated with those experiences are the same, regardless of whether you call it sexual harassment or not. So it, it is and it isn't important to understand the labeling. It is important to understand labeling in that it is a natural precursor to reporting, but it isn't important to understand in that the outcomes don't seem to care whether you call it sexual harassment or not.
another reason why um, women aren't reporting is because reporting breeds retaliation. Um, Lilia Cortina and I have done some work on trying to understand retaliation that is associated with sexual harassment. And we can talk, you can talk about retaliation in both professional and social realms. And retaliation is quite common. Um, it is also one of the number one reasons why, um, why people don't report is just simply a fear of retaliation. So the retaliation can include things like given less favorable job duties, demoted, denied a promotion um, in terms of professional things, but also people are concerned about social retaliation, being shunned, being gossiped about, being criticized for complaining about the situation just in a very, in a very general sort of way. So this idea about um, feared retaliation is also a, a limitation for why perfecting reporting um, procedures is not ultimately going to be super effective until we, we actually are able to deal with the retaliation that people are actually fearing. So reporting is not a silver bullet, that when we think about um, trying to fix these issues, it is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, reporting actually puts excessive burden onto victims. It ignores victims' fears. And we need to do a lot of other kinds of things instead. Um, we need to work to dispel the belief that the only appropriate, um, that, that reporting is only appropriate for the most egregious acts um, that are more sexual, more assaultive, more coercive. Um, as organizations, we need to be setting appropriate sanctions and then actually enforcing those sanctions around um, harassment. And we also, in trying to think about how do we want to try to resolve issues around sexual harassment, we really need to very carefully understand the prevalence of the harassment that is going on in an organization, aside from relying on formal reports. Um, this can be done via conducting climate surveys and, and trying to understand really what is the behavioral frequency of things going on within an organization. My second myth and the last of our series of myths is that harassment training is a silver bullet. And um, when we think about um, harassment training, there are a lot of relevant fallacies that are out there. Um, one of these is simply that because we care and spent a lot of time and money, our training works. Um, that the training works because we have low reporting. We've talked about that already a little bit, but, um, but there's, there's this understanding that we have low reporting, so that must mean that our training worked in some, in some way. And then there's also this idea that one and done is really all that's needed, that a lot of organizations are, are thinking about training as sort of a one-shot effort um, and thinking that that's actually effective. Um, when we think about training and, the, and this realm, even of the fallacies, um, there is certainly support for training around sexual harassment. The courts absolutely value training efforts. Um, so it's, it's not foolproof, but when, when organizations do engage in training, the courts do view that favorably. Um, human resource professionals also often tout the necessity and the effectiveness, whether truly evaluated or not, of their training. Um, and so this idea about um, that, that training is sort of the end all be all is a pretty widespread one because of some of these, of some of these reasons around courts and the human resources. Um, there's actually very little empirical evaluation of sexual harassment training, unfortunately. So there are a few published evaluations. Um, there are pretty serious methodological limitations to those studies. Um, the evaluated training that has been published is oftentimes researcher designed and it's unlikely to be used outside of that research study. So we have a lot to learn about sexual harassment um, training just in a real general way. What I want to um, show you is some data of evaluating training that I've gathered over the years um, to just sort of poke at this effectiveness of training to um, think about whether it really is doing what we think it's doing. So um, one, of the, one of the assumptions is that training actually affects knowledge around sexual harassment. So you go through, whether it's online or in person, you go through a training um, program, and the assumption is that when you come out of it, you're gonna be more knowledgeable. And so I 
um, I've evaluated several sexual harassment training programs. And as part of the evaluation, we ask knowledge questions. And so we have all kinds of questions that we ask. We ask questions about perpetrators, about sort of psychology, about the complaint process, about law. And then we compared whether people were untrained or trained um, in terms of just whether they got the answer or got the question correct or incorrect. And then we also asked whether they didn't know as well to try to reduce sort of guessing a little bit in the process. Um, and so what I'm gonna be showing you is actually too much information in some ways, so I apologize. Um, but, but I'm just gonna show you the percentages of trained and untrained who got each of these questions correct, incorrect, or they said that they didn't know. And I'm gonna just highlight where there's a statistical difference between the untrained and trained groups, okay? So whenever there's a little white box, that's where there's actually something statistically different, okay? So first of all, um, yes, the trained people were more likely, 68% compared to 45% of the untrained um, people to get one question right about the law. That's the only question that they were more likely to get right. And this is data, this is data based on um, about 900 people, I believe. Actually, that's not true. It's actually a lot more. I don't know the exact numbers, but I, uh, I don't, I, it's well more than, it's well much, uh, much larger sample than 900. Um, percent incorrect, there was no difference across trained and untrained um, uh, participants in terms of getting something incorrect. But the trained people, if you look through all of these, um, 1.7 versus 5.5, 3.6 7 versus 7.9, 16 versus 26, 11 versus 21, the trained people were statistically less likely to say that they didn't know. So they're not more likely to get it right, but they at least are more confident, erroneously, or kind of vaguely. Um, it's not, it, regardless, it's not encouraging. They're not getting it more, they're not getting the questions more right, uh, or, or more likely to get, it, um, to get it right. So it increases certainty, but not necessarily correctness. Um, and I'm not sure why this is coming through again. I apologize. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> um, how about attitudes? So one of the things that we can also look at, at is whether uh, trained people have different attitudes than untrained. And there do seem to be effects on attitudes that trained um, people are more likely to have positive opinions of policies. They're less likely to think that their organization is tolerant of sexual harassment less likely to say that um, harassment is trivial or false and exaggerated. So those are all good things in terms of post-training effects. But behaviorally though, um, trained and untrained employees are no more likely um, to personally experience or witness sexual harassment, label their experiences or label witness experiences as sexual harassment, and they don't engage in any of the coping types that I talked about previously in any different kind of way. So there's, there's no evidence that training is actually affecting the experiences that people are having in the workplace, which I think is, is arguably the gold standard for training. So training is not a silver bullet. It's not reducing sexual harassment. Um, additionally, compliance-based training, which I didn't get into some of the details on um, empirically, but compliance-based training is sniffed out by organization employees, um, which affects learning motivation, it affects perceptions of tolerance of, of sexual harassment as well, um, and is important to kind of keep in mind. And uh, we need to do a fair bit of work around evaluating effectiveness of training, understanding and reducing cynicism around training. And there's a lot of question right now about what is the best approach in terms of training. The EEOC has advocated that respectful workplace training is superior to actually engaging in sexual harassment centered training to eradicate sexual harassment. Um, and they have been developing and working on respectful workplace um, trainings that are out there. And one of the things that, um, that also is coming out of the NASM report is that organizational climate change is really important in terms of trying to understand how we can end sexual harassment. 
So what you did, what you were asked to do at the very beginning of this session is to go through and describe the climate at Gladstone. And this is a, um, a word cloud from your responses. So 21 people filled out that little quick survey at the very beginning of this. And I was frantically trying to download those data and make little pretty pictures and get them uploaded. Um, so I didn't hear a single word that Lilia or Kate um, said, I will be honest here, because <laughs> um, I was making some pictures. But one of the things that I think really comes out in this, um, in understanding the overall climate at Gladstone is that a lot of people were saying that it's collaborative, open-minded, friendly, supportive, hardworking, inclusive. These are all some of the bigger terms that are coming up here, right, overall. So overall, there's a, a fairly positive feel from the people who participated in that survey at the beginning of the session about the climate. What's interesting to look at is to, um, to, to take a look at, do those climate perceptions differ based on power? And we can talk about gender as a power source, and we can also talk about organizational structure as a power source. And those were the two additional questions in that very quick survey that, um, that you completed. And so I broke out then these word clouds by, um, by men and women non-binary. So in terms of thinking about power, societal power, that's the way that it would break out. And then also based on whether you are in an upper level administrative position or not. And there's some kind of interesting things going on there. So it's a little small, so you might need to kind of zoom in your face to the screen here. Um, but if we look at the, um, the slide for men who did this right now, uh, we still have inclusive, friendly, cooperative, open-minded as being um, sort of big terms that were used. Women and, and non-binary respondents we're doing similar kinds of things. So um, supportive, cooperative, just, fun, inclusive. But then you start seeing some other things that, um, and these should be proportionate to the, the respondents in terms of the, um, the things that are showing up here. But for women, their dysfunctional is actually fairly large, um, uncertain, disorganized, um, stressful. And there are some over here for the men as well, unpredictable, inefficient, isolated, rushed. Um, but it's, it's sort of interesting to think about um, the extent to which men and women are perceiving, um, women and non-binary, non and I'm, again, I'm clumping them in terms of a power, power analysis, but um, the extent to which we see perceptions of the climate differing there. Um, and, and where might these, these um, depictions of the climate actually be informative and interesting in pursuing for future conversations. Um, similarly, when we look at, at the kind of upper admin um, versus the people who are not in administrative posi positions, um, it's not surprising that the upper admin, you see sort of stressful and anxiety kind of popping up a little bit more. But there still is a lot of cooperative, collaborative, respectful kinds of things coming up in here. Um, and you see this as well for the non-admins. Um, and But it's, it's interesting to see sort of how they might differ. And again, I just grabbed these pictures, so I don't, I don't have great interpretations on what these really fully mean. But you see things coming up like chaotic um, and um, and the, what was the, uncertain is another sort of bigger, um, bigger one, disorganized um, as coming up over here. Whereas some of like the bigger, the bigger things that are coming up aside from kind of the cooperative and collaborative things are more stressful and, and anxiety. Um, the, but there is some disrespectful micromanaging, authoritarian that's coming up from the upper admin as well. So I think it's interesting to think about how does this climate then lead you to think about um, where do we go? What do we do? How do we understand the organizational climate at Gladstone in terms of moving forward? So when we think about this idea of what comes next, um, it might be a value for, um, for you as an organization to consider what issue or issues does Gladstone need to address? Um, maybe these word clouds could be helpful, maybe not necessarily from the limited participants who did this right now, but 
Maybe it's a process that might be helpful for you for in the future, right? Um, how does Gladstone's history, either short and long-term, affect its readiness for change? Uh, who's necessary to be at the table to really discuss the issues? And are there any small wins that might really inspire greater change for the long-term? Um, so moving beyond some myth stuff to kind of think about sort of what's next and, and how, to, how to move forward and progress. So that is the end for me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. I think we want to move next into some um, general Q&A. So if there are participants who want to verbally ask their question, they can raise their hand um, and I'll be able to unmute you. So while we give folks a chance to do that, I have a few questions from both the uh, chat as well as some private messages. So I'd like to kick it off um, with maybe a bit more of a philosophical question. You know, we we call this sexual harassment and that it's a very broad term um, that encompasses many things, but it sounds like most of the sexual harassment that people are experiencing are not due to sexual acts. So should we consider renaming this to gender harassment or gender discrimination or something that's more descriptive of the actual um, position that people are being put in. So maybe um, Lilia, I'll, I'll kick it off to you first. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I've actually given a lot of thought to that exact question, like what to call this thing, because actually the term sexual harassment is, is sort of a misnomer. Um, I don't tr I don't like the idea in general, or I, I avoid using gender harassment as the larger umbrella term because for years it's been recognized as like a sub a facet, and gender discrimination is already an existing term. So sexual harassment includes gender harassment and is a form of gender discrimination. Um, so because these terms already exist and they have other kinds of definitions or overlapping definitions. It could also lead to ambiguities, and part of this is also the way the law uses these terms drives a lot of the way that people think about them. Um, now, to the most descriptive term that I sometimes use is harassment based on sex and gender, which is a total mouthful, so it's not something that I use often, but it would be a more, uh, well, it might give people pause to think, what's that about, as opposed to going straight to the stereotype of um, sleep with me or you're fired. I would also say, I, I just want to invoke some, one of the points that Vicki made in her talk that, you know, a lot of times we struggle to, to claim or, or name some of our experiences in a particular way, but that the naming itself actually doesn't necessarily change our experience. So I do think it's actually important for us to continue to have conversations around what terms mean and how to define them. Um, but I, I would also say that sometimes there's also like to sort of step back from sort of a, uh, uh, what we so often are forced to use, which are these terms that are either sociological or, um, or legal, but to step back into like a restorative justice or transformative justice framework, we think of it in terms of more like um, impacted parties. Uh, so who's, you know, who's been harmed and who has caused harm, um, which then also um, starts to move us away also from terms like victim or target or instigator, instigator or perpetrator. So there is, a, there is a whole conversation to be had that sometimes our use of these different terms then also makes us feel like we're then uh, stuck into different tracks of then how we handle the particular situation. Can I jump in for one second here too? I, I think that that's one of the big problems within organizations too, is that people have experiences and they, they don't necessarily know how, what to call them they take their experience to somebody in the know within their organization, whether that's HR or you know, a Title IX person, an ombuds person or whatever. And there seems to be a lot of effort to try to call it something, which then directs toward some kind of a legal reaction when if you ask the person, what do they want? They want it to stop. They don't care what it's called. <laughs> they just want it to stop. And, and then the, the, a lot of times the powers to be also start getting caught up in, but does it rise to the level of a legal implication or a legal threshold? And the person doesn't care. The person just wants it to stop, right? So I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's 
of great value to try to take that restorative justice type of perspective um, and be centered around what the what the target victim is really wanting. All great points. I want to question. I want to ask a question next about unconscious bias, and do you think that plays a role in sexual harassment? Uh, Kate, let's start with you. Sure. Um, it, hmm. I'll be very interested to hear what Lillian and Vicki have to say, because I feel like I have a slightly uncharitable response to that, which is that I find it exhausting to have, like, hmm, try, I'm trying to put on my diplomat hat here, and you've asked me a question that makes it hard for me to keep my diplomat hat on, but I find it, I find take it interesting. It <laughs> I find it interesting that we so often, and not, I'm not saying this because of the person asking the question, I mean, like, this is a conversation we have all the time. I was just in a documentary where the whole, like for 30 seconds, but the, the whole documentary, the whole point of it was unconscious bias is why we have sexual harassment. And I actually take real issue with that personally, because I think what it does is by making, using that term like implicit bias or unconscious bias, we abdicate responsibility of the, of the systems and the people that are perpetrating harm. Um, and so, yeah, of course, there are ways in which we have, like, we have all been acculturated in a white supremacist society that values cisgender people, that values gender conforming behavior, that values white notions of what constitutes professional behavior and civil behavior, um, and that punishes people who do not act in a certain way, right? Um, we have all been acculturated in that. Uh, but I don't know that we're really at a point anymore that we can always call that unconscious. I guess that's, that's what I'll, I'll leave it at. And then I'll leave it to Lily or Vicky to say something better. So um, my thoughts on this. So, so this question in my mind cues up questions like, is, is sexual harassment intentional or unintentional? Is it, is it conscious or unconscious behavior? Is it deliberately harmful? You know, does it come from a place of malice? or a place of ignorance? And my answer to all of those questions would be yes. I mean, sometimes it's this thing, sometimes it's other things. Um, exactly. Sometimes, yeah, people don't realize that they're treating uh, women employees or employees who identify outside the gender binary or employees of color, they don't realize they're treating them differently from other employees or treating them as lesser than other employees. Um, but regardless of these things, whether it's intentional or not on the part of the actor, on the part of the target, it can still be deeply harmful, deeply offensive, um, even if the person didn't mean it. Sometimes they use that as a sort of an excuse, like, oh, just, just joking. Um, regardless, uh, it can still be just deeply harmful and, and upsetting and distressing to the person on the receiving end. Um, so in, in, in one sense, it, it kind of doesn't matter whether it's conscious or unconscious. Um, it's, it's helpful in the sense of, you know, we're not talking just about really blatant, nasty, obvious acts of misogyny. Sometimes, yes, but oftentimes it's not necessarily that. Um, but so it's, it's, we, we kind of need to broaden our understanding of what is unacceptable offensive conduct, and it does include these so-called low-level forms of sexism or little jokes or little slide comments, snide comments, um, you know, broadening people's construal of what's inappropriate, what's behavior they should not be engaging in, what are the kinds of jokes they should not be making on the job um, can be one way to, 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 or one goal to hold here. Vicki, do you want to add anything to that? I always want to add things. <laughs> um, so I, I, I totally agree with both Lilia and Kate. And I think you also have to understand that we are all sort of victim advocates as well. So I think all of our answers are going to be sort of along those lines, right? Um, but so of course, unconscious bias can play a role. Of course, that doesn't excuse it. I think is the bottom line, right? Um, and one of the things that I think drives me nuts in thinking about the, and, and even in witnessing in like my own working experience, right? And recently, not like it's, you know, 20 years ago or something, but it drives me nuts when senior leaders um, let it go. They let little things go that can be kind of pawned off as, 
as the joke or as the whatever. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and it gets, you know, so it might be grounded in an unconscious bias, but in the process, it harms people. It can kind of completely um, sort of disrupt sort of functioning of a unit. Um, I was in a meeting um, some time ago when uh, one of my colleagues got a little out of control and my leader didn't do anything about the situation. And we completely just, it just shut down the meeting and we didn't get through our agenda. We didn't get to continue. And it was, it was really pretty interesting. Um, and it, so it's, it, to me, it really gets back to sort of accountability for intervening and particularly on the part of supervisory types of positions. Um, and unfortunately, there's not enough um, sort of training, I think, for handling those kinds of difficult conversations in the moment where it's sort of subtle, um, but it, it's clearly kind of escalating as, it's, as the time is uh, moving forward. Um, and yeah, it may have started an unconscious bias, but it's damaging and the, there's not accountability for, um, for somebody to actually step in and do something about it. So speaking of supervisors and their roles, uh, I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, we haven't seen a, a shift in the amount that hasn't been reported, um, but we have seen recently a, um, a renewed interest in increasing diversity across multiple fronts at senior leadership levels. And on one hand, you might think that, you know, if you have a diversity of opinions that might reduce um, sexual harassment, but it doesn't seem like it, that's happening from the, some of the, the long-term data. So I'd like to get your thoughts on how just increasing diversity um, broadly may or may not affect uh, sexual harassment and gender discrimination. Um, so I can, I can start. Um, in terms of, uh, again, going back to the research record, um, there's been a lot of studies of what increases or de decreases the risk that sexual harassment will happen in, in a particular setting. Um, and one of the risk factors that really stands out is gender diversity or gender imbalance. Um, simply put, settings that are either structurally or uh, stereotypically dominated by men or you know, men are there in much larger numbers, men dominate the top of the power structure, and it's a field or an occupation that is stereotypically you know, men's work, so to speak. Those settings have much higher rates of sexual harassment than either gender balance settings or settings that are more female dominated. Um, so one of the um, implications of, I mean, a number of studies have shown this just descriptively, where is the harassment happening? And that's what they're finding. One of the implications of that is a very, sort of a relatively straightforward way to, min to reduce sexual harassment is to hire more women, promote more women, retain them and, and integrate them into every level of the organization so that power and authority are shared uh, uh, across genders, uh, all genders throughout, throughout the organization. And, and the idea is the various theories as to why male, male imbalanced or male skewed ratios predict more harassment. But the idea is that if, it's, if you can achieve greater gender balance or greater, um, less male dominance in general, um, that you will have lower sexual harassment rates. I think it's just to throw out there, uh, just to second some the um, Lilia's point is, you know, it's not that like women are magic, right? We're not trying to put them on a pedestal or anything. Um, and I think probably many of us can point to moments when we've had, uh, you know, we've, we've experienced bullying or intimidation from a woman. Um, but what, and, and in fact, that's like one of the most common questions that I get when I, when I give talks of this nature is like, well, what about the bullying women that I personally experienced? And yes, of course, like the thing is, is these systems of power were produced by men or historically produced by men and, and women who have, you know, if you're going to succeed up these rungs, a lot of times you have to adopt certain dominant behaviors in order to make your way up. But the research supports that the vast, vast majority of, of perpetration and leadership 
uh, is, is coming from, you know, the, of, of perpetration is coming from men. Um, and so even though I think sometimes we have these notable experiences because they feel like a betrayal, um, you know, a lot of these things are happening, you know, a lot of the perpetration is actually happening from men. And so the more often we can get people into leadership positions that, that, that hold those non-dominant identities, the more we can have a more diverse, a, a greater diversity of perspective and more innovation in the ways that we think about how to handle these issues. And I also think that um, one of the things that's a real challenge about um, thinking about hiring more women and promoting women and this kind of thing is that just because women are being hired and promoted, like hired into leadership kinds of positions and promoted into leadership positions, um, that doesn't mean that they have to bear the burden of the organizational change around the climate change toward gender, right? So mm -hmm. their, their sheer presence um, is not going to be enough but also they don't have to be the only ones who have to be responsible for it, right? That it has to be a shared responsibility if there's to be any change to actually happen. Um, I think it's just really important to kind of highlight in there too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a, another question from the chat around demographics. Um, are offenders typically in a supervisor or more of a coworker role or is it split? More coworkers than supervisors. Um, so sexual harassment is often a sort of lateral phenomenon, peer to peer. Um, it does happen top down from supervisors to subordinates, but just you know, looking at the sheer numbers when you survey people or interview people about uh, their experiences and who's been mistreating them, more often than not, it's a it's a coworker rather than a supervisor. Interesting. One of the other things that um has caused quite some discussion in the chat is around um, the data that there was more sexual harassment in medicine versus other fields. And I think um, some folks might have been surprised by that. What are your thoughts as to why this seems to pop up specifically or, or more so in this field than others? So, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, please go ahead, Kate. Oh, it just it seems to be a combination of um, the particularly punishing way that training happens in medical contexts and in the culture around hierarchy. So the reason that in general we often say that we see more sexual harassment in the sciences is just because of the particular culture where the where the climate rather where the condoned behaviors and the um, unwritten rules and stuff encourage a lot of selfishness, a lot of one upsmanship. A particular type of ruthless competitiveness um, that places people above each other. And so um, medicine is where we see this in the greatest degree. Uh, and again, particularly if you think about the ways in which they're trained, you can see that the hierarchy is such that you are going to be punished and endured, endure really terrible conditions as a more junior person, and then you sort of work your way up. And that creates a very rigid hierarchy. Um, and in fact, while that might not be as extreme in, say, engineering, engineering is the second greatest among the STEM disciplines that we've looked at. Um, because of the fact that, again, they also have a similar uh, culture and a similar rigid hierarchy. Really I thought? That, that was the same kind of thing I was going to say. Culture. All right. Uh, Claire, let's see if I can unmute you. Here we go. I think so. Um, I have a question about women's initiatives and these um, types of training programs that are often um, in the last few years popping up a lot about um, confidence training or negotiating skills. And, it, and I wonder if these are effective in any way, because it seems like it puts the burden back on women to change the culture that they are sort of powerless to change and also takes time from their day away from doing other duties. And the people that come to these trainings are often the women, so that all the stakeholders are not at the table. So I was wondering if there's any data out there, because we do invest time with this at Gladstone. Um, and could that time be better spent doing something else more meaningful? So I don't know any, any um, actual evaluation data. Um, and I think it's important to also think about, in that evaluation process, what is the criteria? Right. I mean, what do you what what do you need for something to work? Um, you know, so they probably do increase confidence. They probably do increase negotiating skills. Um, 
you know, so it, in terms of doing those kinds of things, does that change the, the kind of message within an organization? Probably not, not per se, right? Um, it, you, I think that focused climate change efforts around respect and inclusion um, need to happen to really drive that kind of change. I don't, I don't necessarily think though that that means that you don't, that you don't do and you don't offer those kinds of things though, right? I mean, I think it is important. I do think that women don't have the same kind of negotiating skill training. They don't have, I don't know so much about confidence, but, but um, there's some, there is some evidence that this, although this is old, um, that women negotiate are much less likely to negotiate starting salaries um, which makes a huge lifelong earning difference. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that women, at least historically, have had the same kind of negotiating skills training. So I wouldn't, it's not like I would say to cut it off. In the same kind of way that I, I wouldn't say that just because sexual harassment training doesn't seem to be doing what we think it needs to be doing, I wouldn't say necessarily that it shouldn't be done at all, right? Um, so there are people who are going to benefit from it. Is it going to fix everything? Absolutely not. Um, is it a first step? Potentially. Does it start getting people talking in the right ways? Potentially. But if it's done as a one and done, no way, it's not going to do anything. But if it's part of a bigger picture and a bigger story that's happening within an organization, sure. Um. There's just one thing I want to add to that. And I, so I just put an article citation in the chat and it's about racism, not sexism, but I think it's still a really relevant qualitative paper. Um, there's this way where these kinds of women's initiatives, what they're doing and they're creating, in the words of this paper, effectively creating what's called a counter space. So a necessary space for the folks with a non-dominant identity in order to feel uh, have at least some feeling of safety, some feeling of camaraderie, some way of coming together and saying, wow, my lived experience is really different from everybody else's. Can we come together and find some healing, some companionship, some whatever. The whole, the problem though, and, and, and it's necessary. I think it's necessary, I think it's necessary at least to some extent to create counter spaces. But the existence of a counter space means that the majority space is hostile to those people because you wouldn't need a counter space if the original space was great for them. So what I think needs to happen when thinking about cre the creation of counter spaces is what are you additionally doing to take the main space and making it less hostile to those people you're trying to serve in this little corner room over here where they should be doing their science, but now instead they're learning about negotiation, right? So are we, so, you know, like I said in my talk, social support is incredibly important, bringing people together with similar lived experiences so they can check their thinking, create companionship, um, you know, not feel gaslit by their experiences. That's really, really, really important. But if we're not at the same time saying, let's also turn our critical lens on the experience of what it's like to be in every other space in this organization, then it's the counter space is, is only creating, um, you know, a small moment of safety in what otherwise might feel pretty hostile. Yeah, that's a great point, Kate. So maybe we should spend some time talking about ways that we can, um, you know, either at an organizational level or even within individual labs or departments. How do we encourage those safe spaces um, and give people a chance not only to be heard, but also to affect a, a larger, you know, change within their cohort? Um, so maybe Vicki, do you want to start us off? What are some ways that we can help these people feel like, you know, they have a place to voice their um, their experience, but also that someone is going to listen and do something about it. So I, I'm not explicitly a consultant, right? But I, I, I do pretend at it sometimes in, in certain circumstances <laughs> uh, in terms of like trying to create organizational change in this way. And the, the, the construct that I always come back to is that of psychological safety. So it's a construct in the organizational psych literature that really talks about the safety for people to voice um, kind of critical thinking in an environment, um, to voice kind of dissent, um, to, to disagree with kind of the, the um, MO, right, in, a, in any particular group. And um, I think that the, the ability to create 
to evaluate the existence of first, and then if it's lacking, to actually create psychological safety is a really important piece within any kind of work unit. So there, there are a lot of things that can be done to actually creating psychological safety though. Um, and, and I think some of these things can be really very quite, very, or quite simple. Um, I work in a, in a, with a grassroots group at my home institution. And uh, one of the things, we had a lot of internal conflict within that group where people didn't feel like they could voice. Um, they didn't feel, there were pretty wide power differences among the members of that grassroots group. Um, and we instituted a public voting process in our group where we vote with our thumbs. And, and I, I'm part of that group, right? And, but I, I kind of initiated this process because I kept having people come to me saying, you know, like, oh, Vicki, I'm going to leave this group because they're not listening to me or whatever, right? And there's dissent on all sides. So it was pretty conflictual. So we decided that we needed to actually just step back and we needed to really carefully consider what our decision-making processes were. And, um, and we needed to be transparent and accountable for those decision-making processes. And so by doing our thumb voting, we did that. So we, we have discussion, pro like moments around whatever topic we're talking about. And then we'll just say, let's shoot the thumbs. And people will say, yes, I'm good with that. Or I need more information, thumbs sideways. Or no, I don't, I don't agree with this, the direction that this is going. With the full understanding that if you do thumbs down, that you are then accountable for creating an alternative approach for the next meeting. Um, so that nobody could to nobody had the right to block anything without coming up with something in the future, right? So it's a really simple, almost silly kind of thing sometimes, but it's massively, it's been massively effective for our group because everybody's vote is important. The, the, there are some like really high level people in this group and their vote is no different than we have some janitors in our group. Um, and it's their vote is exactly the same with the thumbs, right? So it, it kind of created a, an equality just right off the bat, but then an accountability as well. And nobody could go, it, and also the transparency was really important too. Um, nobody could then go say, well, you know, I didn't really agree with so-and-so and kind of do that gossipy kind of stuff off to the sidelines. So I think that that's, that's a simple kind of thing to think about in terms of, um, of creating change. Another really important thing that is just not done often in units, in organizations, is just being very explicit about the behavioral expectations and setting the explicit norms. So in the work that I do consulting with groups, I always say at, the, at any sort of natural beginning of any group, the leader needs to come in and start the very first meeting by saying, we are a respectful culture. We are a respectful group, and we're gonna need to hold everybody to respectful terms in this. And so if I miss something, please tell me. If I see something, I may or may not say something right here, right now, but you better believe I'm gonna say something over to the side, um, and then I'll expect behavioral change for the next go around, right? And so just, we don't talk enough oftentimes about what those true behavioral expectations are, and then what are the consequences for broaching those, those um, expectations. And it doesn't have to be that you get a formal written record, right, in your, in your personnel file. It can be just that your supervisor comes and says, like, what the heck, like, don't behave like that, you know? And it, maybe, maybe you need to think about this a little bit more, like, are you, are you okay, <laughs> right? You know, like actually having conversations. I've talked for too long. Somebody else. No, that was great, Vicki. Thank you. I, I just want to um, uh, just be mindful of the time. So I think I will kick it over to you to uh, wrap us up. I want to thank all three of you for your time and your willingness to keep talking. I feel like we could have gone on for a very long time. Um, if people want to stay on the Zoom for a few more minutes, that's great. Um, but I'd like to sort of officially close the, the meeting. And thank you pro profoundly for your time with us. It was really meaningful. Thanks a lot.